The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, and welcome to Utilizing SB 1141, California's Coercive Control Bill, a training for practitioners, co-sponsored by the Family Violence Appellate Project, the LA City Attorney's Office, and the San Diego Volunteer Lawyer Program. This webinar is hosted by the Legal Aid Association of California, also known as LAC. My name is Erica Howard, and I am the Trainings Associate here at LAC. We are the membership organization for California civil legal aid nonprofits. Our job is to advocate in the legislature, in the courts, and with the State Bar of California on behalf of the community of nonprofits that serve low income Californians. In addition to our online and in person trainings, LAC provides coordination and advocacy for increased funding to support organizations like yours. Today's session is presented by Corey Hernandez from the Family Violence Appellate Project. Pallavi Dewan from the LAC Attorney's Office. And Stephanie Baez from the San Diego Volunteer Lawyer Program. Before we get started, we want to mention a few logistical notes. If you're having any technical difficulties with the GoToWebinar system, please call 877-582-7011. If you have any questions about this specific webinar, you can email us at trainings at lacconline.org and I will try to get back to you before the webinar ends. Everyone on this call is muted, so if you have any questions, please feel free to send us, your, um, to send us them using the chat box. The session will be recorded and materials will be posted online after the training. They will be made available within three business days. And now I'll pass, pass us off to our presenters. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you everyone for being here. My name is Pallavi Dewan. I am the Director of Domestic Violence Policy for the Los Angeles City Attorney's Office. And uh, my office uh, sponsored SB 1141. So I'm really excited to be here today to talk to you about it. We'll start with a, an overview of SB 1141, um, sort of the origin story, and then go into the pre-SB 1141 case law, um, possible effects on family law proceedings, and we'll conclude with the effects on criminal law proceedings. But before we dive into the material, I want to turn over, um, I want to turn over the presentation to my co-presenters to allow them to make their introductions as well. So Corey, do you want to start? Thanks, Pallavi. So this is Corey Hernandez. I'm a staff attorney at the Family Violence Appellate Project. I use any gender neutral pronouns and they, them, um, and I'm happy to be here. Thank you. And Stephanie? Hi, everyone. My name is Stephanie Baez, and I am a supervising attorney at the San Diego Volunteer Lawyer Program, where I work in family law and domestic violence. Um, and I'm also happy to be here today. Thanks for joining us. Thank you both. Um, so it's a, it's a good day to be with everyone. Um, if we can go to the next slide um, and then the next slide. Thank you, Corey. We'll talk about what um, the background and, of SB 1141 and what really brought it to life and how it um, became a new law. So last year was an interesting year because, well, for many reasons, but legislatively, um, because of the pandemic, legislators were told that they had to uh, pare down their proposals and include only what was uh, relevant or related to COVID to the pandemic. Um, so the session itself, the legislative session was shortened and the bills were uh, pared down. Um, again, to only what was related to COVID. And so um, when this bill began, as I said, my office sponsored it. And my background is as a criminal prosecutor. I spent 13 years with the LA District Attorney's Office, uh, specializing in family violence, child abuse, and domestic violence cases. And so um, I am now, the, as I said, the director of domestic violence policy. And so as you all know, domestic violence is a crisis. It's, it's an epidemic and 
during COVID, it became even more of a crisis. I think um, the shelter in place orders brought to light for a lot of people, the uh, isolation and the fear that survivors of domestic violence live with every day, um, even in the absence of a pandemic. And so when we set about trying to um, ensure that this legislation didn't get discarded due to the pandemic, we it wasn't difficult at all because um, as you see from the legislative findings, the data shows that in times of natural disasters and crises, rates of interpersonal violence rise. Um, financial strain brought about by the pandemic does not help, it aggravates those circumstances. And so um, as expected, what we saw, well, actually what we saw initially, what I saw initially was a drop in the number of calls to police, but then as, as the uh, shelter in place orders began to be lifted, we started to see this increase. Um, and, and throughout the country, there was an increase um, in reports of domestic violence assaults. The other noticeable trend was that the assaults were more severe in nature than in previous years. So if we can go to the, uh, the next slide, yes, thank you. So, uh, you know, this isn't new to us. Uh, we, we know how abusers work. Um, COVID-19 gave abusers an additional tactic to control and isolate their uh, victims. And so what was already a crisis became a really a dangerous situation that uh, we wanted to prioritize um, by bringing this legislation forward and uh, specifically by naming this harm of coercive control. So again, some jurisdictions reported a drop in domestic violence calls, but we knew that that was because of underreporting. So, um, that's the background of of the legislation and how we were able to keep it within um, Senator Susan Rubio's legislative uh, priority list. Um, she is the one who authored the bill. She's a tireless advocate for survivors, and so we were really honored to be able to work with her and with the Family Violence Appellate Project. So I'm going to, um, I think at the next slide, I'm going to turn um, this over now to Corey. Uh, let's see. Sorry Corey? about that. I was um, oh, no, that's all right. accidentally muted. Sorry. So no thank you, Melody. Yeah. So the bill, uh, in addition to having those uh, legislative findings that kind of grounded the reason for enacting the bill, um, now we're going to jump into what the bill does substantively to the law. Um, so here we see that the bill, and we're going to actually look at the language in the next couple of slides. Um, basically what it does, it amends the DVPA by adding to uh, one of the statutes that defines what constitutes abuse for purposes of um, requesting or issuing a restraining order. And that definition is already quite broad. It you know, includes physical and non-physical abuse, sexual abuse, threats, harassment, and um, this very broad phrase called disturbing the peace. Um, so what SB 1141 did is three sort of main things substantively. So one, it codified a definition of disturbing the peace. We'll see that that definition came from case law. Um, it also codified a definition of coercive control. Um, as a part of disturbing the peace, um, and there are different elements to meet for coercive control there. Um, and then it also provides some examples of coercive control, a non-exhaustive list, um, so that there are some more guideposts for courts who are um, ruling on these types of cases. So we're gonna look at here, there we go. So this is the actual language from SB 1141. So this is being added as a new subdivision C to 6320. Um, so this language says here, so as used in the subdivision disturbing the peace, uh, the other party refers to the conduct that based on the totality of the circumstances destroys the mental or emotional calm of the other party. Um, that third bullet point is highlighted and noted, noted because that is verbatim just the definition taken from 
the case law, um, which is important because that codifies the definition. Um, so that means that courts couldn't, you know, further modify it if they need to further, um, but also makes it more uniform, um, as we'll see, so that courts are applying it across the state. Um, this conduct can be committed directly or indirectly, including through the use of a third party by any method or through any means, not limited to telephone, online accounts, text messages, internet connected devices, or other electronic technologies. Um, it's important in these fourth and fifth bullet points here to sort of clarify how this conduct can be committed and by what means, because some courts, um, even with case law that we have, still sort of think that de domestic violence has to be direct, you know, one person to another, or, um, and some courts kind of struggle with more virtual abuse, things that happen online or electronically, uh, just because that's not sort of the common usual pattern that we see in a lot of uh, literature. So this conduct, so again, this is conduct referring to disturbing the peace. This conduct includes, but is not limited to coercive control. Um, so situating coercive control within that, which is a pattern of behavior that in purpose or effect unreasonably interferes with a person's free will and personal liberty. So again, this is defining, this is now defining coercive control, um, not disturbing the peace, because um, that was already defined earlier. Note that coercive control requires more than one act um, because it requires a pattern of behavior, whereas typically for other types of abuse, as we'll see um, via Family Code Section 6300, other types of abuse, you just need one past act of abuse. Um, but to meet the coercive control definition, it requires more than one act. Um, note in the third bullet point here in purpose or effect that you could try to look at the respondent's state of mind and try to look at their intent or mens rea um, but of course, as many of us know, that can be very difficult to prove, trying to prove somebody's state of mind. Uh, so you can instead just look at the effect, look at what happens to the survivor. Um, what was the effect on them emotionally, physically, financially, et cetera. Um, the fourth bullet point here unreasonably interferes with that unreasonable, uh, we'll see again. Uh, that was an important addition just because there are some um, acts that may interfere with somebody's free will and personal liberty that some you could uh, qualify as reasonable. So for instance, if a parent is disciplining a child and they take away their allowance um, or limit their computer time or something like that, um, that would technically that could you know meet the definition here if it weren't uh, reasonable in that situation. So here we have some examples of course control. It's not uh, an exhaustive list that says but not limited to. Um, so here we'll see there's four examples. So one, isolating the other party from friends or relatives or other sources of support, depriving the other party of basic necessities, controlling or regulating, monitoring the other party's movements, communications, daily behavior, finances, economic resources, or access to services, or compelling the other party by force, threat of force or intimidation, including threats based on actual or suspected immigration status, which is an important note. Um, that's the first time that threats on immigration status has been expressly codified here in the DDPA, um, engaging in conduct from which the other party has a right to abstain or abstain from conduct in which the other party has a right to engage. Um, so note that some of these examples focus on the impact of the survivor, like the first two kind of look at whether the survivor has been isolated or deprived of basic necessities, while other examples kind of fo more focus on the respondent's behavior, whether they're controlling or regulating the survivor. Um, now, the last section here, a section does not limit any remedies available under this act or any other provision of law, is just to make clear that even though we're kind of further defining abuse, this is not meant to restrict court's ability to um, help survivors and fashion appropriate remedies for them when they're seeking protection. And um, before we jump into the case law, this will be the first case we look into, um, but I just wanted to pull a quote from here that I thought was important to keep in mind when looking at the statutory language. So this is from In Remarriage of Ned Carney um, from 2009 at 173 Calop 4th, 1483. So this quote here says, the DVPA was intended to provide more protective orders to a broader class of victims of domestic violence. Thus, the DVPA reflected the legislature's goal of reducing DV and its recognition that it is virtually impossible for a statute to anticipate every circumstance or need of the persons whom it may be intended to protect. So the courts must be entrusted with authority to issue necessary orders suited to individual circumstances. So this is particularly important if you ever run into a judge who says, well, 
you know, your case doesn't quite fit one of the four specific examples in um, course of control listed here. Um, and so you can easily just point them to this quote from Ad Carney and say, well, the intent behind the legislature is not to capture everything possible, but to just provide some examples for the court and leave the language broad enough so that courts confession remedies appropriate to specific cases. Uh, and when we jump into the case law, I just want to note, we will be taking questions at the end. Um, so if you have any, you can share them in the chat uh, feature, I believe, and then we'll take them at the end. Um, and then also we'll have our contact information at the last slide. You can always contact us for additional questions. So now jumping into the cases here, this is uh, again, Nod Carney. This is an important case because it was the first case to define disturbing the peace under the DVPA. Um, and is actually a pretty good example just in general of statutory construction if you're interested. Um, but here's a quote that kind of shows you what behavior they believed constituted disturbing the peace in that case. So here's the respondent's conduct included accessing, reading, and publicly disclosing, disclosing the content of the petitioner's confidential emails, and that his conduct caused her to suffer shock and embarrassment, to fear the destruction of her business relationships, and to fear for her safety. Um, so here, you know, this pretty clearly meets at least one of these examples in the new statute from SC 1141 in terms of, you know, monitoring or regulating somebody's um, electronic communications. Um, now, important to note, we're going to look at some other cases to see other examples um, that have also applied this definition of disturbing the peace, and they've all applied the same definition. None have applied a different one. Um, but we're not going to look at every possible case. There are a lot of published cases out there that uh, construe it, and we'll just look at some of the highlights. So here's from 2014, Burkett v. Brumbaugh. This was an important case in particular because it expressly rejected the criminal law definition of disturbing the peace. Um, we see a lot in DVPA cases where uh, usually the respondents will try to bring in criminal law provisions to the family law, uh, which is often not successful. Um, here, the court found that this conduct um, constituted a the peace when the defendant, um, because of his inability to accept that his romantic relationship with the plaintiff was over, um, despite plaintiff's numerous requests that he not contact her, engaged in a course of conduct of contacting the plaintiff by phone, email, and text containing inappropriate sexual innuendos, arriving at her residence unannounced and uninvited, refusing to leave, making a scene when she refused to see him for the purpose of causing her to renew the romantic relationship. Um, so I highlighted some of those to um, note the to underscore um, the post separation abuse that or assault that um, occurs here, and unfortunately we we'll see this quite often. Um, there's a lot of literature out there showing that um, the time, the period of separation, um, is often the most dangerous or lethal for survivors um, because the abusers often feel they're losing control and they don't want to uh, lose access and control over the survivor. Um, this isn't obviously a case, uh, but I thought it was an important piece of legislative history that kind of fits well within this trajectory of case law. Um, so this is from uh, AB 2089 from 2014. There's a citation there, so that's 2014 chapter 635. So in section one, there are a bunch of legislative findings um, that are really good to look at. And if you're, uh, if you are ever writing a brief, whether at the trial court or appellate level, um, this is a really good statute to kind of go back to time and again, because a lot of the legislative findings there uh, are just really useful in terms of what they talk about, how survivors respond to abuse, the types of abuse that can occur, uh, why restraining orders are important, stuff that you may uh, otherwise need to look at secondary sources like social science to get to, but instead if you can look at legislative findings, then that, that obviously carries more weight uh, in the eyes of the court. Um, so AB 2089 did a lot of things as a bill. Um, it added many provisions to the DVPA, um, specifically said that the court can't rely on the duration of time since the most recent incident of, of abuse in granting or denying a restraining order. This is codified at Family Code Section 6301. Um, the court must state its reasons on the writing, uh, sorry, in writing or on the record if it denies a restraining order. This is codified at 6340. Uh, the court must also do a dominant aggressor analysis before it issues a mutual restraining order. This is at 6305. Um, but that also here, um, it also states that uh, abuse is not limited to the actual infliction of physical injury or assault. Uh, 
and that's 60, uh, sorry, Family Code Section 6203. Um, but then, as I mentioned in the legislative findings here, it says that DV is not limited to actual or threatened physical acts of violence, also includes sexual abuse, stalking, psychological and emotional abuse, financial control, property control, and other behaviors by the abuser that are des designed to exert coercive control and power over the victim. Uh, so that's the first time, I, I believe, that may be one of the first times that coercive control as a phrase had been sort of codified in um, the family code in California here. Um, and of course, now we have SB 1141, which actually makes it a part of the statute and not just uh, legislative findings. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Stephanie. Thank you. Hi everyone, this is Stephanie Baez from the San Diego Volunteer Lawyer Program, and I'm going to uh, continue down our review of the case law that was in place prior to SB 1141. Um, so the next case here is Evelsizer versus Sweeney, and in this case, um, the the basic facts here are that uh, a married couple husband obtained basically tens of thousands of text messages from wife's phone. Um, downloaded all of these messages, including uh, messages from her notes app on her iPhone, which she had used as a diary. And it was a substantive amount of material. Um, during discovery, they calculated that it would have been 219,000 pages of printed material if this had all been printed. And these messages were obtained without wife's consent. Um, and then they were disclosed. Husband went around to uh, wife's family, to her parents and disclosed messages. Um, he um, threatened her to, that he was going to publicly reveal information from her messages to her friends and family. Um, he attached various text messages at stages during the litigation. Um, he threatened to post messages publicly on social media, um, and he he disclosed her private messages to a custody evaluator during their, their divorce uh, proceedings. Basically, he was using these messages all over, and he was threatening her with them, saying, you know, if you don't do kind of what I want in this divorce proceedings, then I'm gonna post more of these messages and contact more people. Um, so she sought and obtained a domestic violence restraining order and basically testified about how upset she was because of this, um, the, these actions that he was doing with disseminating and threatening to disseminate her private messages. And the trial court held that, um, that, that she could have a restraining order, that to protect her peace of mind, um, husband would be enjoined from disclosing or threatening to disclose these messages. Husband appealed and he argued that he um, legally obtained these messages, that he got them from her phone, that he didn't engage in any illegal contact to get the messages and that he could um, go ahead and do what he wanted with them because he had uh, legally obtained them. The Court of Appeal affirmed the restraining order and they um, made it clear that even if the abuser legally obtained the survivor's information. Regardless, they didn't say that it was legal what he did, but they said, we don't even need to go there, even if it was legal. Um, the disclosure and the threats of disclosure of that information were enough to disturb the peace of the survivor, and that's enough to issue a restraining order preventing him from, from doing this action anymore. Um, and there's a quote here in the slide. This is actually what the, the trial court said to him. And they said, you're going around either disclosing or threatening to disclose to the third parties for no particular reason, intimate details of your lives. And that's what I think is happening here. And that's a direct reference back to the Ned Carney case that um, Corey already reviewed for us. And it's basically um, just aff affirming that standard that a restraining order can be issued just based on disturbing the peace alone. And it's important to note in this case um, there were no allegations of physical abuse. Um, it, and um, the abuser actually tried to distinguish this case from Nakarni based on that, because in Nakarni there were some allegations of past physical abuse in addition to disturbing the peace. Here in this case, there were no allegations of physical abuse. And even so, um, the dissemination and threatening to disseminate these private messages, that was sufficient because it disturbed the survivor's peace um, sufficiently to um, have her obtain a restraining order. Um, Next slide, slide, please, Corey. Thanks. Um, in this next case, Altafula versus Irvin. Um, in this case, um, again, we have a married couple and wife had an affair. Um, husband found out about the affair and he sent emails to wife's employer and their mutual friends um, attaching a surveillance report that had photographs of the man he believed she was having an affair with and it had details about, you know, she's having an affair with this man and he, he disseminated that to uh, her friends, family, and coworkers. Um, 
he also told her children who were ages 17 and nine years old that their mother was having an affair. And basically he sat them down and described oral sex to them in graphic detail and told them that their mother was engaging in oral sex with another man and told them that they uh, could potentially contact STDs if they shared towels with their mom and they, they shouldn't share towels with her. Um, the 17 year old was so upset by this that she actually um, ended up going into an inpatient psych psychiatric unit. The, the situation at home was so bad and she was so disturbed by um, what her stepfather was telling her about her mother's um, sex life. So the, the wife sought a restraining order here, um, and the trial court found that she was legitimately in fear of ongoing harassing behavior um, from, from her abuser and granted her a five-year restraining order because of his behavior with um, dis, dis, disturbing her peace. Um, husband appealed, and on appeal, his main argument was that his statements were factual that it is true that wife was having an affair. And so because he was just spreading uh, truthful information, it couldn't be abuse and it can't be the basis for a restraining order. Um, and the Court of Appeal held that the domestic violence, uh, uh, the DVPA protects against the use of um, arguably accurate information. If that information is used in a manner to cause extreme emotional distress. Um, and here, just reading from the slide, the court found that uh, the abuser's distribution of information about the survivor's affair, which she plainly did not want to share with her co-workers and with others, was no doubt calculated to cause and did cause, well, it, it actually doesn't even say it did cause, it says it was just calculated to cause grave emotional distress. Um, and the statements made to her children were similarly calculated to, and here they did in fact cause significant both uh, emotional distress, both to her and to her children. So because of that, again, the court said it doesn't matter if this is truthful information or not truthful information, it's being used um, to, to cause her distress and it's disturbing her peace. And because of that, the restraining order was granted. Um, next slide, please, Corey. Um, this next case, Rodriguez, um, in this case, there was a history of both um, physical abuse and controlling behavior in a relationship. And the survivor ended the relationship um, at, at a certain point because of the abuse, but then uh, discovered she was pregnant and she ended up getting back together with her abuser. And while she was pregnant, um, she was also in college and her abuser enrolled in three of her four courses in college. Um, you can see from this slide here, the court quoting some of the facts. Um, and in the class that he wasn't enrolled in with her, he caused her to keep her cell phone open, like to have a live call go going during the class so that he could monitor her. He wanted to know if she was talking to other people, who she was talking to. Um, he also made her do the same thing when she was at home and he was monitoring her activities when she was at home to see what she was up to. Um, her mother testified to that, that that, that was something that was um, going on and that she had seen happen. Um, next slide, Corey, there's one more on this on this case. Um, so then some additional facts on this case, um, in addition to this monitoring of her with through the phone, um, he, he did a lot of other disturbing things. He sliced the neck of her teddy bear and said that that's what he wanted to do to her. Um, he also um, was aware that she had a diagnosis that, that made it necessary for her health to limit strenuous activity and stress. And even though he knew about that diagnosis, he practiced martial arts close to her. Um, kind of threatening like he was going to harm her. He played with a knife close to her face. He threatened to beat her with a studded belt. Um, and he threatened that if she called the police to report any of his behavior, that he would assert that she was actually the one who had abused him. Um, eventually there was an incident where she was having some health problems and he drove her to the hospital and he was driving erratically and really um, scaring her a lot on the, on, the, on the freeway. And when she got to the hospital, she reported what was going on to her medical providers and they called the police. And at that point, the couple separated. Um, and that happened in February of 2014 when the couple separated. And a few months later in July, she, she saw him or she thought she saw him and it was really scaring her that he was still lurking around. So she, she sought her restraining order a few months later. And when she sought her uh, restraining order in the trial court, uh, the trial court actually denied the restraining order. And the trial court relied on two main reasons um, that, that were brought up in appeal. The first was that the evidence she prevented of the mental abuse and controlling behavior that had occurred 
were not relevant to the court's determination of whether domestic violence had occurred. And then the second reason was that they found that she was convincing and, and, and credible that past acts of physical abuse had occurred, but they found that those past acts occurred in the past and that as of February of 2014, when the couple separated, um, that she was no longer in danger of those, that physical abuse reoccurring in the future. Um, so this case, she appealed and the appellate court said, um, no, uh -uh. She, she, she deserves a restraining order that under the law, she's met her burden to get a restraining order. Um, going through the, the two issues. So the first issue I said is that the trial court had said, we're not gonna consider evidence of mental abuse. And I'm actually gonna read for you exactly what the trial court said, because it's, it's a fascinating quote. The trial court said, quote, there's a whole movement who believes mental abuse ought to be considered domestic violence. For whatever reason, the state has not adopted that in its domestic violence statute. So being unpleasant, generally not saying nice things, excluding you from friends and stuff, that's probably not under all facts and circumstances, it's generally not domestic violence. If you happen to be controlling, I don't think it's a good thing to do. It's unpleasant, but it's not something that this court is going to sanction. So basically the trial court was directly saying coercive control, disturbing the peace, mental abuse, none of this is actually domestic violence. And they were relying, they were saying because it had not been codified yet. Um, and this is really interesting because this case, the Rodriguez trial court decision actually came out before um, the case law, or the um, AB 2089 that Corey just read for us a few slides back, which was the section of the DVPA that codified um, basically saying we don't need physical violence to, to create abuse. So the trial court made this, this ruling um, and kind of said there's case law out there that says this, but since it hasn't been codified yet, we're not gonna, we're not gonna follow it. The appellate court said, no, 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 there is case law that clearly you know, says this. And they went through the cases that we've just discussed, Ms. Carney, Burkett, Elvis Iser, and said, look, in all of these cases, it shows that um, this disturbing the peace, controlling behavior that is, is domestic violence and needs to be con considered. Um, and also the court dropped a footnote saying, because at the time the appellate court ruled, um, AB, um, AB 2089 was in effect. And the appellate court said, AB 29, uh, 2089 just codifies what the case law has been saying all along. It doesn't create new law. It just clarifies what, what the case law has already been, um, been saying. So um, that's just very an interesting interplay between the cases and the statute. Um, and the court said this mental abuse and the controlling behavior needs to be considered. Um, the court also held that the physical abuse um, also is grounds for a restraining order. So this is just a you know, practice note for, for those who are um, practicing in, in um, domestic violence law. The court also specifically held that the, the, there doesn't need to be a finding that, um, that a physical abuse is gonna happen in the future, that just a finding, and they did say it was credible that it happened in the past, that's sufficient. Um, there does not need to be a showing of probability of future physical abuse. Um, so that's the Rodriguez case. Um, Corey, could you go to the next slide, please? Uh, next, we have Phillips. And in the Phillips uh, v. Campbell case, this is also a case that furthers our definition of um, what's going on with uh, disturbing the peace. But it also is an important case that clarifies what is a dating relationship. And this was really the first case that dealt with a dating relationship pursuant to the DVPA. Um, so, as you know, one way to get a restraining order, a domestic violence restraining order, is um, to have either a dating relationship, another way would be to have a certain blood relationship, but there needs to be a requisite relationship between the parties for it to be a domestic violence restraining order, as opposed to a civil harassment restraining order that would happen between um, neighbors or people who don't have the re requisite domestic relationship. So in this case, the parties um, both contend, they agree that they never went on a date they never engaged in a sexual relationship. They met in a cycling club. Um, and it, it seems like from the facts and things that the court pieced together, that they shared a kiss, um, that the abuser spent a few days in the uh, survivor's home for, you know, they spent, he crashed there for a few nights. Um, he sent her nude pictures. And basically he made it clear that he wanted to move forward in the relationship and, and make it a romantic um, relationship. And she said, no, I, I wanna be just friends. Um, and when she kind of rebuffed his advances to create this into a more romantic relationship, um, that's really when he engaged in this pattern of abusive behavior. 
And as you can see quoted in the slide here, some of the, the behavior that he did, he came to her home at 3.30 in the morning, uh, banging on the door and windows. He um, harassed her by sending her text messages, posting her personal information and photos on Facebook, posting videos of her on YouTube, um, sending private messages to individuals about her, um, calling her a psycho evil witch, a compulsive liar, basically just, you know, just disseminating all this information and all of this kind of vile information about her that he would put um, on the internet and coming over to her house. Um, so the court held that this pattern that he was engaging in was sufficient for there to be a domestic violence restraining order, um, that the actual, you know, the abuse that he was, that he was engaging in qualifies as our disturbing the peace um, definitions of abuse. But the court also held that even though, you know, survivor had wanted to be just friends in this relationship, that looking at kind of the totality of the circumstances here, there actually was a, um, a dating relationship. Even if the parties hadn't gone on a date or hadn't engaged in sexual relationships, that the nature of the relationship, looking at the totality of the circumstances, classified as a dating relationship because there was an intention and a desire for affection between the parties is, is what the court determined. So this is an interesting case if you ever need to look into um, kind of the definition of relationship. This, this case really goes into depth on that. Um, and it also holds that, that disturbing the peace um, is appropriate to grant a restraining order regardless of physical violence. Um, one other quick note about, sorry, this case, just one quick thing, is that um, it also addresses a, a First Amendment issue. And the First Amendment is raised in some of these other cases too, um, Evelsizer and Altapula. So these would also be interesting to read if, you, if you're curious about the First Amendment side of this. But basically in this case, um, the abuser said uh, that, that the restraining order, which restrained him, it told him not to post photos, videos, or information about the survivor to the internet and told him he had to remove that information from the internet over any site that he had control over. And he said that was a violation of his free speech, that he you know, could be able to do that. And the court said, um, basically, no, it's not. That, that his ability to engage in, act, in an activity that has been determined abuse under the DVPA is not protected speech. So if the, if the so-called speech is determined to be abuse, then it's no longer afforded constitutional protection. Um, okay, next slide, please, Corey. Next two slides um, discuss uh, Rybolt v. Riley. And this case is actually a renewal case. So if you're ever looking at the standard for how to renew a domestic violence restraining order, this case has a lot of very helpful guidance about that standard. Um, basically, what was going on here is, is there was an underlying restraining order between the parties. Um, and the restraining order was issued because um, the abuser had sexually assaulted the survivor, stalked her, and threatened her. Um, the case doesn't go into a lot of detail about that, the past abuse, other to say that that's why the, the underlying restraining order was granted. Um, and then it goes into what is the standard to renew, because she's seeking to renew a restraining order um, and to have the restraining order ongoing. And the case goes into that the, the standard for renewal is a preponderance of evidence that the protected party entertains a reasonable apprehension of future abuse. So that means that a reasonable person in the same circumstances as our survivor would apprehend, would have fear that abuse might occur in the future. Um, this case makes clear that there is no requisite showing of violations of the restraining order. So if someone has a restraining order and that five-year restraining order has been put into place and then they want to seek a renewal to uh, maybe make that restraining order uh, infinite at, you know, at the end of it when it's set to expire. All the survivor needs to show is that a reasonable person in the same circumstances would have apprehension um, that violence might occur, that abuse might occur in the future, but no uh, showing that violations occurred. But even though that's the standard, the court found here that there actually were violations of the restraining order and those violations tie back into our disturbing the peace. So on this slide here, you can see, again, some of the facts that occurred. Um, the, these parties had children together, and a big issue was what's going on at their extracurricular activities and parent-teacher conferences. And uh, the abuser would show up to these and stand closer to her. The order said that at these activities, they could both be there for some of them, but it had to be 25 yards apart. He would come closer than allowed. Um, he would tell her that he was going to attend events, and so she wouldn't go, and then he wouldn't attend the event. He was just kind of telling her that to mess with her. 
Um, he would come to sporting events during her time, but then not care about the events during his, his own parenting time. Um, or he would send some family members who had also harassed her in the past to these events. Um, and so then the trial court found basically that that, that was sufficient to be abuse. Um, here's some, some more incidents of what happened on this next slide, that uh, he insisted on attending parent-teacher conferences. Um, he said that he was not able to schedule a separate conference, even though the court said, or the school said, you can have a separate conference. He said no, you know, and he would show up at hers and make her anxious, and she was basically very nervous all the time, believing that he would show up. Um, the court found that this behavior was a violation of the restraining order. Um, and especially coupled with the underlying abuse here that she already suffered, the sexual assault and stalking that she had um, suffered from him, um, that this behavior was disturbing the peace and that these were violations of the restraining order. Again, violations of a restraining order are not necessary for the renewal, but regardless of that, the court said these things, these behaviors, even though you know it, it, it might seem minor to someone who hasn't suffered the trauma that she suffered, that these things are disturbing her peace and that these things are sufficient for her restraining order to be renewed. Next slide, please, Clay. Um, next, we have the Nicole G case. And in this case, again, we have a pattern of, um, of behavior that uh, basically increased in level of these certain acts that were designed to establish and maintain control over the survivor here. Um, the pattern included things like sending text messages, um, constant text messages, constant phone calls, tracking her phone, letting her know that he was tracking her phone, you know, sending things like your phone's in the house. And I, you know, basically saying, I know where it is. Uh, repeated calling, following her and sending messages so that um, she knew that he knew where she was at all times, um, changing the locks so she couldn't enter her residence. Um, and basically just established that there was a pattern of um, control here that was sufficient to grant the restraining order and, and provide her protection. Um, the other interesting thing about this case is that it was a move out case where the parties had been living together in a shared residence that um, Nicole, our, our survivor, she had actually purchased the place and um, the abuser was a co a, a joint tenant on, on the property. Um, and she had been in the process of moving out of this apartment while she filed for the restraining order. Basically, they were going through a breakup and she was trying to move her belongings away. And so he argued, well, I live here now, she doesn't. So you can't give a move out order that's going to kick me out of this home. And the court said, no, we, we can. <laughs> that we found that there is um, a restraining order here, that there are grounds, and that um, basically that there's evidence of continued physical or emotional harm if the parties continued to live together. So they granted her request that she has possession and control over the property and that he's the one to move out. The court did note we're not making a de decision of who ultimately owns the property. There was an, a simultaneous case going on in civil court regarding that issue, but the court said she gets possession and control under this restraining order while the civil court works out that issue. Um, next slide, please. McCord v. Smith is the final case that I'm going to talk about today. Um, and this is a case, again, where we have a um, pattern of exercising control and um, dominion over, over our survivor. Um, the parties were engaged, and um, when, when the survivor tried to end the relationship, the abuser spent went on a campaign of months of emails, texts, phone calls, showing up uninvited to her home, going to her place of employment, going to her friends and family's homes, um, uninvited. He showed up at her daughter's home and said he wanted to throw her a surprise party, you know, a surprise birthday party. And it was like, no, this relationship is over. Um, but even so, he, you know, at, after the end of that relationship, he was still trying to um, um, get, get back together and, and basically not leave her alone in terms of just showing up uninvited to, to all of these different places. Um, he also engaged in threats against her and he also engaged in physical force against her on a few occasions. Um, and also, he took a picture where he texted her a picture of her nursing license and basically put a quote next to it saying, you know, you wanted to fight. I didn't want to fight. And then he sent nude photos of her past that. And she interpreted that to be a threat that he was going to, you know, try and get her fired, disclose her, her pictures to, um, to her employer. So um, 
The trial court um, just basically found that, that everything that was going on, that these acts were sufficient to constitute a disturbance of her peace, as well as stalking, threatening, and harassing. Um, they also found that she was credible in her testimony when she talked about um, the user's use of her personal photos, he used her codes, he used other personal information against her, which caused her not to feel safe anywhere, at home, at work, at church. Um, and also, he filed false criminal charges against her, and said that she was um, abusing him and that she had threatened to kill him. Um, next slide, please, Corey. So uh, looking at all of those things and including the allegations that he filed against her, the court found that she was the more credible um, um, person here and that what was going on was a pattern of abuse by him against her. Um, and that um, that it was sufficient to engage, uh, to, to enter a restraining order. And there's a lot going on here. So in this case, you know, there were a lot of different things, stalking, threatening, harassing, and exercising control. So it's important to note that the court was looking at the totality of the circumstances. Um, and as Corey mentioned previously, when talking about the new coercive control legislation, to meet the definition of coercive control, there needs to be a pattern established um, so for coercive control, it needs to be more than one act. We need to show that there was a pattern going on. Um, but if your client just has one incident of abuse that occurred that was an incident of um, uh, physical abuse, stalking, you know, those sorts of things, there are other occasions where one incident of, of abuse might satisfy, might, might be sufficient to get the restraining order. Um, but to meet the definition of coercive control, there, there generally needs to be a pattern. Um, and just two other important things to note from this case. One is to highlight that in this case, the abuser filed um, um, a cross restraining order against her and also um, filed a false police report against her. And um, this was also behavior that we saw back in the um, Rodriguez case where the abuser said that he would you know, turn the police against the, the survivor if she called the police. Unfortunately, this kind of behavior is fairly common, um, and it's something that is especially relevant to LGBTQ communities where mutual arrests and mutual restraining orders occur at a disproportionate rate. So that's just something to be aware of, that that can be an additional act of, of abuse um, that, that an abuser engages in that tactic. And then the final thing to note about this that's important to be aware of is the revenge porn and non-consensual porn issue. Um, which is becoming more and more of a problem in our in our current um, world um, because there are very few regulations and laws on the issue. Um, in McCord, luckily, the the court agreed with the survivor that um, by the the abuser sending a picture of her nursing license along with pictures of of her naked, that that was a threat and that that did constitute disturbing her peace. Um, but this is just an issue that can sometimes be um, very tricky just because of our lack of regulations and laws surrounding that issue. Um, and that's it from me. So I think I'll I'll turn it back um, now to Corey to talk about um, SB 11, 1141's effects on family law proceedings moving forward. Thanks, Stephanie. Yeah. So I um, just want to also highlight the, the one of the reasons we wanted to include all this case law um, is. SB 1141, you know, we view it, and I think the legislative analyses confirm this, um, you know, that just clarifies existing law. Um, as we saw, the definition of disturbing the peace came from case law from Ed Carney in 2009, and um, a lot of the examples of course of control and that definition itself also came from case law that then followed it um, from Ned Carney on. Um, so I think that's just important because when you're construing, you know, new statutes, new laws, uh, one place to look is past um, past cases that have interpreted similar or the same laws. Um, so you can, even though you know this is a quote unquote new law, you can still point to these past cases as support um, to just further emphasize and underscore what's um, what we're trying to do with SB 141. So some potential effects um, on family law in particular. Um, so as you mentioned, now there is a codified uniform definition of disturbing the peace um, before, since it was just getting worked out in the case law and since the California Supreme Court has not, in my uh, my knowledge, has not yet 
taken up a case uh, construing the DVPA specifically, um, you know, there is potential for that definition of deserving the peace to change, or there could have been a conflict of a different court of appeal, you know, had a different definition. Uh, but now it's codified and it's set there. Um, another possible effect of the law is that there, um, there are now more examples of course from control, more guidelines for courts to look at. Um, instead of, you know, requiring courts and litigators to have to scour through the different published opinions and kind of pull out the facts that support them, uh, which you could still do. And as, we met, as I just mentioned, you should still do if you need to and can. Uh, but now you can also look at actual codification in the statute itself. Um, it also, the bill also now expressly brings into the DVPA the ideas and definitions of coercive control, financial abuse, tech abuse, and threats based on immigration status. As we've talked about, those have, many of those uh, issues, many of those types of abuse have already been uh, brought up in various cases, but now again, it's just expressly codified within the DVPA itself. Um, Another potential effect is, of course, by creating a sort of new law, and um, although we are saying it's just clarifying law, a lot of people view this, may view this as sort of expanding the definition of abuse, um, or also the idea that, well, now many survivors, if they're pro per, may not have had access to these cases, may not have known that coercive control and these other types of behaviors constituted abuse. Well, now if they're able to look at the statute, which is freely available online, and hopefully the Judicial Council will be updating their forms, the DV forms, the DV 100 and so on, um, to also reflect the uh, the definition now under SB 1141, um, there's a potential for more restraining order requests, more people knowing that their uh, the behaviors that they are experiencing constitute abuse, so they may feel more comfortable and safe filing a request, which uh, could lead to more litigation and of course, potentially more case law itself, not only from increased litigation, but also from the need to further work out these additional terms that have now been added to 6320. Uh, you know, while it's good that we brought in course of control, financial abuse, tech abuse, threats on immigration status, stuff like that, um, those ideas, those concepts will still need to be worked out in the case law, especially these new uh, these newer words like deprivation, it doesn't have to be a total deprivation, can it be partial, um, isolation, how isolated does somebody have to be, basic necessities, um, that's not defined in the law, but you could always look at um, other areas of law like child welfare and the welfare institution code, there's a definition, or in the penal code for criminal law, uh, public benefits, we can look at federal law, there's different um, areas you can look at, which basically to say, um, these terms of art, these uh, legal terms that we've added to the statute will just need to be worked out further. Um, and I think that's about it there. I'm going to pass it off to Polly for potential effects of the law on criminal proceedings. Thank you. Um, so I mentioned earlier that my expertise, my experience is in criminal prosecution. So um, even though SB 1141 sits in the family code, it crosses over into the penal code through the evidence code. And so I'm going to start by telling you the general rule, which you may already know um, about character evidence, what is called character evidence, uh, the rule of how character evidence can be introduced in a criminal prosecution is that it cannot. Evidence of a person's character or a trait of character is inadmissible when offered to prove that a person acted in accordance with that character. There are certain exceptions, um, but the general rule is that you cannot say that somebody committed a crime because they have um, a reputation, say the crime is theft, um, and the person has a reputation of lying. You cannot say that because the person has been known to lie, they're guilty of this theft that is uh, charged. So again, there are exceptions, um, and those exceptions 
really have to be relevant to an issue in the case. Otherwise, this general rule governs. Uh, the next slide, please. So there are exceptions um, that apply across the board in domestic violence and sexual assault and child abuse cases. So the other exceptions that I mentioned relate to um, issues in the case uh, like motive and opportunity and um, intent. If the person's character trait is relevant to those issues, for instance, then uh, the prosecutor is allowed to introduce the person, the charged person, the defendant's reputation um, on those relevant character traits because they bear on an issue in the prosecution. When it comes to domestic violence, the prosecutor doesn't have to fit the, um, the character trait into these categories. They can simply rely on this general exception set forth in evidence code section 1109, which holds that um, in a criminal case where there's a charge of domestic violence, this is sort of like a strange way of phrasing it, but the point of this language is to say that the prosecutor can introduce this evidence, that this evidence is admissible, um, and this evidence is prior domestic violence. So in a case in which the defendant is accused of a crime involving domestic violence, evidence of prior domestic violence is admissible, subject to the judge's discretion, which um, is exercised under evidence code section 352. And 352 is basically just, um, it's a list of factors that the judge is to consider before it allowing the evidence in. But again, the rule for domestic violence cases is that um, if the case, if the current offense and the prior offense involve domestic violence, then the evidence is admissible. All right, sorry, can you go to the next slide? Thank you. So what the question then obviously becomes, what is an offense involving domestic violence? So, um, under the penal code, domestic violence is defined more narrowly than under the family code. So under the penal code, section 6, 13700, domestic violence is abuse, and abuse is intentionally or recklessly causing or attempting to cause bodily injury or placing another person in reasonable apprehension of imminent serious bodily injury um, to himself, herself, or another person. So you've learned now um, from the, the prior speakers that the family code definition of domestic violence explicitly states that violence need not be physical. Well, the penal code definition is far more narrow, both in terms of the definition of abuse and in terms of the victim. So for purposes of the penal code, domestic violence applies to adult intimate and former intimate partners. Whereas the family code, as you know, applies to broader categories like children and um, cohabitants that aren't intimate partners, uh, certain relationships like parental, siblings. So this is important because the evidence code section that allows for prior evidence of domestic violence references the penal code definition, that narrow definition, but it also references the family code definition. So. And it has this caveat for the family code definition that it has to have happened this prior domestic violence within five years of the charged offense. But if that threshold is met and the judge exercises his or her discretion under section 352 to allow the evidence, then the prosecutor prosecuting a current crime of domestic violence, let's say um, assault, can bring in prior evidence of domestic violence under that family code definition. Um, next slide, please. So I already talked about the um, the two. Okay, so I talked about the definition um, already under the family code and the penal code, and now that we have this expanded um, or this you know whatever you want to call it this this codified definition of disturbing the peace that includes the phenomenon of coercive control as a specific subset of disturbing the peace, that 
updated definition carries over automatically to that evidence code section that allows the prosecutor to bring in the prior evidence of domestic violence since the definition of domestic violence has been updated in the family code. Um, and the evidence code references that updated definition. Now the prosecutor can try and argue for um, prior coercive control to, uh, to uh, bolster the current case. And the reason behind this evidence code section, and which is uh, an exception to that general rule that character evidence is not admissible to prove that somebody committed a crime is that there is an understanding by the legislature um, that domestic violence is not, it's unique, right? It's unique in that it tends to recur. It happens um, in a repetitive way. And so the fact that somebody committed domestic violence in the past and is now charged with a crime of domestic violence, um, those two those two uh, occurrences are not likely coincidental. They are more likely to be a pattern or part of a pattern of behavior. So this um, is relevant because the prosecutor can tell the jury, listen, if you believe that the defendant committed this prior domestic violence that happened five years ago, um, you can use that evidence. You don't have to, you have to believe that it happened. Uh, at, but if you believe that it happened, then you can use that to conclude that the defendant was likely to commit and did commit this current offense, this assault, this kidnapping, this stalking, whatever the offense is that has been charged um, can, be, can be bolstered, can be proven by linking it to prior acts of domestic violence. So this is extremely powerful. It's an extremely powerful argument that prosecutors can make that I have made in the past and that can now be sort of tethered to that updated definition of domestic violence in the family code to show that, um, to make this, this broader argument that, that domestic violence is not merely a physical act or not necessarily a physical act only, but that it is part of a broader pattern of power and control that culminated in this um, most recent crime. So um, that is how criminal law will be affected by SB 1141. Um, I don't have anything else. I wanna thank everyone um, for being here. I'll let Stephanie and Corey uh, make their concluding remarks, but thank you all for, for attending and for your time. And thank you, Stephanie and Corey. Yeah, thank you both, and thank you all for attending. Um, I also wanted to note a couple of resources um, for those who are practicing in family law, seeking restraining orders or helping others. Um, on the Family Violence Appellate Project's website, fflaw.org, uh, we have a lot of free resources for survivors and their attorneys and advocates um, for seeking restraining orders, like trainings on how to request a DV restraining order, what if it's mutual, how to write the declaration, um, we have a compendium of DV laws, the statutes, and a compendium of the DV cases. Um, so lot, all the cases that we talked about today, plus pretty much every other case that interprets the DVPA is in there. All that's available on our website. You can contact me and my contact info is there uh, if you need help getting that. But um, yeah, thank you all. And I don't know if, um, Erica, if there are any questions in the chat or anything that we need to answer. I don't see anything. Um, so with that, I just want to say thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Um, we'll distribute materials and MCLA certificates after reviewing today's in-session times, and you'll likely receive them within three business days. We hope that you'll check out our next webinar, Gender Equity in Sports During COVID-19, a review tomorrow at noon. You can find more information about this and other LAC programs and benefits by visiting our website, www.laconline.org, or by following us on Facebook and Twitter. You can also email us at trainings at lacconline.org um, with any questions about our online and in-person trainings. Thank you for your time this afternoon. We hope to see you all soon at our upcoming trainings.